Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city sweating the small stuff. Ooh. Although, we're not sweating right now. No. Fall is upon us. It has fallen upon us. It's uh, been a quick, uh, a brisk, nice 60 degree weather for the past week or so. Although you wouldn't know you've been in the Bahamas. Where have you been, James? I was in, uh, yeah, the Bahamas, North Carolina. Wait, wait. Uh, no, no. Really? Yeah, I was in North Carolina. Oh, okay, you're in North Carolina. I was visiting your parents. No, but uh, yeah, we're back. We, uh, <laughs> you were visiting my mom? Yeah. Um, well, your parents, specifically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, your mom was like, I, I, I still don't get this stuff. And, and so uh, <laughs> she, she paid for my flight, and I went down, and I explained. Mm. I explained everything, all of industrial design to right. her. So. Um, so yeah, we don't need to do the podcast anymore because that's essentially why we decided to start the podcast. Yeah, we was, only had one listener was my mom was to educate your mother on <laughs> industrial design. <laughs> uh, but no, I was I was down there for um, my wife's cousin's wedding. Oh okay. Um, in uh, I guess it was beautiful, right? It's the oh, color. The fall trees were changing colors. It, it was gorgeous. My my wife's grandparents have a place um, in the mountains. Mm. And it is just I, stunning. I do miss North Carolina. Beautiful state. It is a great state. I have I have enjoyed it the two times that I've gone. Um, it's, you've, but you've been busy though, right, James? Yeah. yeah. Well, as soon as I as James, soon as I got James, back, the the people need an explanation. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm so sorry that I, I've I've fallen behind on many things. Um, but uh, yeah, as soon as I got back from this uh little vacay and this is this has been sort of three months in a row that i've been gone <laughs> it's too much i'm done traveling for a bit um but um yeah as soon as i got back i i started a new project and it was pretty much a sprint you know it was a company brought me in to do basically about a week's worth of work okay but extremely rushed um a week's worth of work in a week or a couple days uh no a week's worth of work i but mean it was it like was, a lot it of was work slated as a two-week project and uh, i was basically okay. doing it in okay. a week yes yeah, so that's a that's a quick project yeah and and so i i had i i thought up of some new advice because we had a freelance podcast where we talked about freelance work mm-hmm. um was that the last one god it's been mm-hmm. such a long time and uh so my advice is because uh, I was sort of kicked back. I, I wasn't not w- working. I was working on a lot of personal projects, but I wasn't. I wasn't necessarily thinking that the next day I was going to be starting a new job. And so my advice to the freelancers out there is to treat every day like that it's you're your not life. working like it's your last day not work like the next day you're going to be starting a project and you're going to have to hit the ground running so what does that mean though does that mean i should work really hard each day to make my personal projects amazing or does that mean i should just take vacations every single day because (laughs) this will be the last day i can take it well what it means is get your affairs in order oh get your affairs in order because i was like well i had i had some things that i needed to get accomplished just in my personal life and And i was like "Ah, i've got tomorrow you grew you had grown a beard yes yeah oh yeah down to the floor Mm -hmm. it's amazing what what uh not shaving for a week will do um no i actually have terrible facial hair i wish it grew that fast but um yeah, I uh, it it just so happened that I got the text. You know, you get that text out of the blue, and you're like, as you know, as a freelancer, you hope you kind of hope for that text. Right. I was sort of putting feelers out there. Yeah. And I got the text of, "Are you available?" Yeah. And the classic. Yeah, and so I slid down that fireman pole in my <laughs> in my apartment, and I just ran out into somebody else's apartment it's it's a really weird situation that we have going on um they weren't aware of it until it happened that'd be really cool actually to have a fireman pole in your house yeah yeah i mean it would make everything you you live on what the 12th floor eighth eighth so a fireman's pole from the eighth (laughs) all the way from the eighth would be a really long pole (laughs) that would be scary well you just gotta like you just gotta you know Get some get some lube on your hands first. No, no, then... no. You don't want lube. You want friction. You got to slow yourself down. It's no. Gonna be an easy landing. No way. No way. I want to go down there as fast as possible. <laughs> oh, no. 
Um, and uh, yeah, but um, so it 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 happened very quickly that this project, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I'm very obviously appreciative that the project came to me and I was able to take it um, because, you know, I'm kind of in between bigger gigs. And so it was like, I just need a small project. Yeah. Perfect little mini mini project. Yeah. It came, it came, uh, it came and went in a week. Um, Today was kind of the last day of wrapping it up. Sweet. Um, So you're back. So I'm kind of, well, I'm kind of like rushing on adrenaline because like the deadline was like noon. So like I, well, I might be be crashing off of the adrenaline. Okay. Okay. Um, But yeah, I, I would say it's just a good idea to treat, to treat your days where you're not working as if the next day you're going to start a project for many reasons. Um, I just think it's like, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't think you necessarily need to like panic that like, oh my God, tomorrow's the day. But, you know, just to have your just to have your affairs in order. I think, and, yeah, that's great advice. You know, and also I think it's just a good mindset to have. Like tomorrow's going to be the day. Like I'm going to be prepared for whatever comes. Right. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. anyway. Well, I'm glad you're back, back, James. I'm glad you. I missed you, man. Oh, Nick. <laughs> I can't say the same. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse no. me. All right. I'm done. I'm no, right. no, no. I was I was in North Carolina and just thinking man i wish i wish nick baker was here to show me around you know you could show me the ropes i could, I could show you those beautiful mountains oh uh the purple's purple mountains majesty i i guess so is that what well the no they're right? more the blue blue ridge mountains blue ridge, yeah. the blue yeah they have their own majesty though um but uh yeah and then um some other some other news i i just got a nintendo switch I, I just cool. wanted to put that out there. Do you have the Smash Bros? I don't think it's come out yet. Did oh. it come out? I, I don't know. I just know the new one's coming out for the Switch. I, yes. don't, I don't have a Switch, but I like Smash Bros. So. so I'm I'm a Nintendo boy. I was a Sega I'm a, boy. I'm a PlayStation boy. Oh, no. I was, a, I was a Sega boy, and then when Sega went under, yeah. I... I, I I just uh, jumped ships okay. to, to Nintendo. So have you played with it? Or it, was it recent? I, I bought it? it a couple weeks ago. Okay. Um, but you've been so busy. Yeah. Although you've been on vacation because you can take that thing on the plane. Right. We, did, we didn't We did take it okay. with us. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things. The Nintendo Switch, when you see it, especially as an industrial designer, you are like, this is... This is that design that in the beginning of your iteration you think of and you're like, that's ridiculous. It that is funny. Nintendo's always the one to push the boundaries on consoles. Yeah. You know, they're always doing the weird stuff. I mean, remember the Nintendo Wii U? U. Yeah. Which was like the dumbed down version of the Switch or something? That I I think that essentially what they did with the Switch was correct all of the errors of the Wii U. Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the Wii U was supposed to be like it was almost like you had a Nintendo DS like system in that you had this dual screen functionality. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it just didn't translate well, and you know you couldn't take it portably. You had this controller that had a screen, so you could play. It connects to the Wii, right? Yeah. Well, I, it's a completely different system. Oh, uh, I, I don't. I, that one was a weird, awkward. Choice. I had the Wii, and I loved the Wii. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't on board with the Wii U necessarily. I didn't. I didn't get it. But um, I the Switch. The thing that the thing that they did with the Switch. So I mean, Nintendo understands that they dominate the mobile gaming market. Like, that's something that they've understood. I mean, yeah, since like, Game Boy, they yeah. dominated that market. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't even tell you what the PlayStation version of, like... The PSP. The, that, oh, right, the Remember PSP. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, they know that they dominate that market. And so, like, this all-in-one system, I mean, it seems like this very gimmicky thing at first. Okay. But, I mean, there's... Like, is it though? I really love it, but the th- the other p- aspect of this is like Nintendo also has great titles and they make great games for yeah, their systems. Yeah, that's their biggest asset. I mean, they have Pokemon, they have Zelda, they got Smash Bros, which combines everything. They got Mario. I mean, those like titles are their gold mine. Yeah, you know. I mean, Zelda is the reason that I like I married my wife. Like. like- <laughs> 
<laughs> it's true. James has told me this story about Yes. That. Yeah. We're both big Zelda fans. Um, but uh, yeah, and and Mario, I've been playing the Mario Odyssey game, which is spectacular. Is it two player? Um, you can, well, you can play as Mario and the second player can play as your hat because <laughs> the hat is an interactive element in this game. So would I be the hat if we play together? Yeah, absolutely. Dang it. <laughs> yeah, you're the hat. Easily the hat. Look at yourself. You're a hat boy. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the cool thing about it is I feel like, yeah, it, it kind of um, corrects all the problems of the Wii U. Like the nice thing is like if, if somebody wants to watch something on the TV, you can just grab the the switch out of the console because it's like it's got this docking station you can just grab it out of there and play on you know, on there that's cool you know but but the thing is is like it also kind of has we like capabilities in that you can get the controllers out separately and use sort of hand motions oh. to guide things okay and yeah i just um i don't know it, it is one of those things where if i I were in that meeting and somebody proposed that, I'd be like, why don't we just make controllers for an iPad? You know, like, why are we going to make our own system for this? Why are we going to make our own, like, little tablet for this? Yeah. But it works because, I don't know, it works because it's Nintendo and they, like, they know it, how to it, develop great games. It's the games. titles. Yeah, it's the titles, right? They're not going to put Pokemon on the iPhone. Well, they, they have the Pokemon Go, but... That's another story. But, you know, they're not yeah. going to put Zelda or Smash Bros. on the iPhone. Yeah. Although they would make a ton of money if they did. They understand that they want to be in the console business, too. Yeah. I mean, they've started making games for yeah. iOS. Yeah, they, they've started. They've dabbled in it a bit. And yeah. and I They're rolling in the dough, for sure. Oh, for sure. Uh, but uh, I think... Um, I don't know. It, I love that Nintendo is still willing to take risks like this to do something that that everybody else would kind of like scoff at yeah and i think that's the value of nintendo too is like that that's why they're still in business because they are the alternative option yeah you got, you got the big boys xbox playstation for the the big gamers but then for those people that want it like more of a casual fun experience like a family time game nintendo sweeps the board Mm-hmm. Yeah. that's cool I'll have, yeah. to, I'll have to come over and play it <laughs> Oh, are you inviting yourself? I, I am. James, wait. You can't tell me about your Nintendo Switch and not invite me Listen, you, you can only come over if you can climb up the fire pole in my, <laughs> in my apartment building. That's your uh, stipulation for any house guest. Yeah. I mean, you'll get swole, you know? Yeah. You'll get, you know, and then you'll break my controllers, but whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know, Nick. That's enough about me. Yeah. I, uh, I've just been working since since you've been gone. Yeah, I I mean I've seen a lot of the work. Yeah, I mean I I've been uh doing some some odd freelance jobs here and there, but um doing a personal project, working on some new almost object products. Nice. Doing like some sort of organization system, uh, like folding tray, mm-hmm. along with a few other elements that uh, kind of like create a family of products. Yeah. I'm kind of excited about that. I I think it's come along well. Um, finished up the design. I've taken it offline just because it's. I kind of want it to be a surprise. Yeah. Um, you know, I I want to release several products next year for Almost Object, and so I'm kind of building up the suspense in a way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm excited about it. I if you hadn't seen it, um, it was a tray that was a flat piece of plastic cut out. And then it had these plastic snaps. And when you put the plastic snaps together, it folded up into a bowl. Or, yeah. Or it could hold things. Yeah. So. I, I'm i digging it. I really like it a lot. You know you know how I feel about those kind of like, those details, like those snaps. The like, snap? It has loops too. Oh, little tiny loops. Loops and snaps. I mean, you've got me. <laughs> the snaps are really satisfying. you got me hook, line, and sinker. I was kind of inspired by like the, the traditional snapback hat. Because it has a little satisfying click, you know? Oh, yeah. So that's kind of like the the impetus of it, I guess. Yeah. that's That reminds me that um, something I haven't talked about on the podcast is that I won a competition to get a Go Hobo hat, custom hat. Oh, right. Yeah, Go Hobo, another Instagram designer. Awesome yeah. Guy. One, one part of Creative Sessions. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and did, did he send you it? Yeah, he sent me it. I, I, uh, I've been wearing it a lot. 
I mean, I like to wear it in the morning, especially if, the, if I, like, go out, go outside to, like, get something for breakfast. Yeah. I just, like, put the hat on, you know? Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I got a camo and, hat. And all the hobos look at you weird, like, <laughs> don't tell me to go. No, they're like, go hobos! Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're, like, really encouraging. Okay. It's like, go hobo. You're yeah. You're doing a good, great it, job. Exactly. Okay. But it's got that snap. It's got those. It's, it's just. Snap rem- back. It reminds me, like, it reminds me of, like, Little League Baseball and just, like, being out in uh, in right field, right? That's the one where you didn't get much action. <laughs> like, that's where they yeah, put yeah. the kid who was really yeah. awkward. That's, is that where you were? Being out there, spinning that around, maybe. Like, that's probably... You what, have a lot of experience. I feel like function. maybe a lot of industrial designers were in right field because all you could do was just sit there and, like, look at your glove <laughs> and look at your hat and just kind of, like, get into the details of things. I was shortstop boy. Oh, you were a shortstop? Oh, man, that's dangerous. That's a dangerous position. It's dangerous, but it's also like a, a coveted position, too. Oh, yeah. But, um, no, I, I've been working on that little project. It's coming along great. Um, next step is just to, like, source it. Yeah, people are clamoring for that next almost object. <laughs> and it's almost here. Yeah. It's, it's almost an object. Exactly. <laughs> this is a great part of the branding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I've been doing that, and I uh, also... This weekend, Whoa. which I guess now that you're listening to it, I'll have already gone, but I'm going to talk at the RIT Thought at Work conference. Nice. I'm going to do a, a workshop on VR sketching. Hopefully it all goes smoothly and, I don't know, people can experience the, the virtual world. Awesome. Well, you'll, you'll have to say what up to my boy, Josh Allen. I've never met him, but uh, but I I really admire that guy. Yeah, I mean, we... I think we shouted him out. We shouted him out a while back, but he he does amazing things, and he's is he a chair professor? I think he's program chair. Chair, okay. Yeah. Um. He he at least made a chair. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Can I can I be a chair if I made a chair? Yes. Or you can actually be a chair. Oh, I could be a chair myself. Yeah. Um. But but yes. Uh. That's exciting. So I'm getting ready for that, and I will update you next week on that. Nice. But yeah, that's that's what I've been doing, just working. Sweet, yeah, that's great. Um, but uh, you know, speaking of uh, star designers, were uh, we speaking of star designers? I mean, I consider Josh. Josh to me is a star designer. I don't know how much like, you know, he. I don't know if he's like superstar. Superstar, but um, I think he deserves to be so. Uh, but. Uh, you know, we talk about star designers a lot. We know we know their names. We know the Karim Rashids. We know the Philippe Starks. We know the Mark Newsons. Right. And there's um, there's this question of like, what what are they actually doing? Do they actually design? Do they actually design? Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Do- I kind of wish. I don't have personal experience working for star designers, but I, I do have friends that have worked for mm-hmm. Kareem Rashid and uh, like Harry Allen. Do you know Harry Allen? Uh, let me see. He did Harry like, Allen. I, I don't know if I'd call him a star designer, but he's like sub star. He's also a B-list, jazz musician. C list maybe. Um, he did the pig piggy bank that looks like a realistic pig. Oh, but but also you know when we when we refer to star designers, I would say that we're referring to the the big names in industrial design. You know, if you searched famous industrial designers, you're going to get Ronan and the Brulek brothers. You know, you're going to get Dieter Rams, Kareem Rashid, Johnny star, Ive. John, Johnny. I, would you consider him a star designer? He's a little different because he is still in-house. Right. As opposed to, like, a star designer having a studio and writing your name on it yeah i think i also think of of uh aura ito and uh, like fabio novem i'm i'm gonna get like names oh like benjamin hubert uh, he's kind of i don't know he's he, kind of like the, he's risen to he's, be a star designer he's the people's star designer yeah I feel he's, like, he's in more a of a because he likes your photos you know <laughs> that that's isn't that interesting thing is that oh the, eve bahar sorry yeah, Yves Bahar is a star designer, but isn't it interesting how Benjamin Hubert is so involved in the Instagram community? He loves sketches. I don't know that, like, I can't tell. Do you think he has an intern just swiping through his feed and liking it? I don't know, because I, I, I don't think, like, because I don't know that he 
is necessarily following anybody. He follows you. We've talked about this many times. Is, is he actually one of my followers? Yeah, because thing... he follows you, but not me. Because the thing is, so... is like... <laughs> well, if Benjamin, if you hear this, uh, you could do some community service and ease <laughs> Nick Baker's mind no, by following no. him. I don't want no pity follow. <laughs> I only want real followers. <laughs> but uh, I, um, yeah, it's it's weird because I because sometimes you know he doesn't. Not that everything that I post is like worthy, but it is interesting to see what he will like of yeah. what I post. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, Fabio November. I I'm not uh, familiar with him. He's uh, you you would know his work. He okay. he actually a lot of his stuff is very like referential of he's very i feel like he's very like he's very sexual in a way yeah but he also he also does a lot of things that are like he does this version of what i would say is like the panton chair but it's um it's like almost like a human is imprinted into the chair it's like you can see like the butt and the feet uh of the person Uh. imprinted in it um so and he does like he does chairs that have like faces on the back and like skulls yeah yeah. it's very like there's a lot of symbols like recognizable symbols in his work there it is so have you ever her chair have you ever worked for a star designer i mean i guess you've i guess i know that the answer is no but no i have never do you have any friends that have i so it maybe think about it i have a friend who worked for career machine yeah um and he he talked he told me about it um and I, you know this is just rumors to the grapevine but right you know i i won't assume that all star designers do this but i would say a lot of star designers have you know juniors junior designers and you know mid-level to seniors working mainly on the designs right i mean star designers not in there doing solid works right Right, you know, Kareem Rashid's not clicking the mouse and like filleting his chairs. You know, like, you know, he has someone else doing that for him. Yeah. In terms of the actual idea, like initial sketching, apparently at Kareem Rashid Studio, a lot of the softer, like flowy forms that Kareem does, is comes from the designers, and Kareem's forms are a lot more angular. Hmm. Like when Kareem sketches something out, it's very angular and jagged. And you can kind of see that juxtaposition. If you look at Kareem Rashid's work, you'll see that there's, you know, the usual, like, the O-chair, the Garbo trash can, a lot of those, like, bulby forms. Mm-hmm. But then there's also these weird juxtaposition, juxtapositions of, like, polygonal, f- like, angular triangles. Right. Um, I, I don't know. I think he did a chair recently that was, kind of, it was, like, formed out of polygons. And, you know, from what I assume from my friend who worked there, Apparently, Kareem Rashid, that was his, like, sketch. Like, that was his right. style, his right. personal style. And I don't know how much validity that has. But, right. Um, I mean, I I've seen a lot of his sketches. To me, it seems like he is he's sketching and then kind of, like, giving the sketch to the design team. Right. Yeah. And, and I would say that's how most star designers work. Yeah. Because... Here's here's the thing, and I, I think I might have talked about this before. I think the role of a star designer, like, when they first start out, they probably are more intertwined into, like, the, you know, creating their brand and yeah. maybe even doing some of that nitty-gritty nitty stuff. But as they start to gain popularity and they start to gain clients, of course, like, you cannot expect any designer to be able to handle all of that themselves. Right, right. And so what they are actually in charge of is like basically um, making sure that everybody understands like what the vision is, what the brand is about, like what their personal brand is about and making sure that everything that's going out the door adheres to that vision yeah because that's that's to me what steve jobs hit like what his legacy is is you know he wasn't a designer he wasn't a programmer necessarily like he was the gatekeeper right like he was like meticulous about like you know 
this is how I want this thing. This right. is the vision for what I want. Yeah. And I'm unflinching in that vision. There's so many good stories. I have, so this this one story about Steve Jobs just popped in my head. I, don't, I forget where I read it, but Steve Jobs, when they were developing the iPod, the engineers came to, to him and they were like, hey, you know, here's the iPod design. You know, we made it, you know, it's however much, two and a half inches by four inches, mm-hmm. right? And then it was like, half an inch thick or something like that and steve jobs takes it walks over you know they're in steve Jobs' office or whatever he has a fish tank walks over to the fish tank drops in the fish tank the prototype the <laughs> functioning prototype drops <laughs> it in the fish tank and he says look there's bubbles coming out there's more air in here take the air out oh, make it smaller oh whoa yeah. yeah 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 that's pretty i mean that's pretty cool <laughs> it, i mean it's definitely it's, like a dick move but also yeah. like such a good like point right yeah i because i mean i notice in there are moments in like in working for different companies and working for different people where you you might think to yourself like i've thought to myself at times like what if we pushed back a little bit more like what if what if you know we were unflinching and, yeah. and uncompromising like of course, you want to compromise and you want to work well with people within the company. And there's a lot of politics that goes into like company design. Yeah. And But like that, just being able to be that gatekeeper and be like, you know, Dieter Rams. Like Dieter Rams didn't work on everything that came out of Braun, but certainly he was looking over everything and making sure that it adhered to the vision that he had set forth. Yeah, I think I totally agree. I think once you get to that stage of, uh, you know, are they CEOs technically? I don't know. They're, they're owners, they're founders. I'm not exactly sure what you would consider the business aspect of their job. But, you know, when you become a star designer, that's kind of mainly what you're doing you're doing the business right you're doing the the talks you're doing the the checks and balances of oh is every everyone in line you're just managing people at that point yeah well and you're and you are winning clients you're working on client relationships like you know which is kind of a juxtaposition because everyone wants to be a star designer but the the job of the star designer isn't design yeah in a way in a weird way yeah it is to some extent, but I mean, I think of it. So, okay. I was, I was in a band in college. Yeah. Um, and I was the songwriter for the band, Okay, but the band was full of musicians that were skilled at their instruments. I would come to those musicians with what I refer to as like the skeleton of the song. Like I had the chord progression, I had the melody but I didn't have much else, like some, like, you know, thoughts about other parts. But then these musicians that I, that I were in my band, they would flesh it out. That's, that's interesting, huh? You know, they fleshed it out to such a degree that I could never have done it myself. Because it's like the star designer or the star musician has the holistic view and then the juniors and the seniors come in and fill in the details. Yeah. Like I... I would love to be in the position of, of uh, you know, like being that person that comes with the the kernel of the idea. I think you'd be great at that, James. <laughs> no, no, I'm dead serious because that's how we, you and I work. Yeah, you, know, you, you are the the beginning stages. You're the the holistic view. You see the, the big picture, and then you know you you can shrink it a little bit, but you brought me in mm-hmm. for that for that one freelance project we were working on together. And I kind of filled in the details. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think that that I don't I I feel like that is eventually like the role that I would like to have. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, here's a, here's another question sorry. for you, James. <laughs> <laughs> but you're just wishing you were a Korean machine. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, I, that was what I was doing right there in that pause. And just start getting those tattoos, man. Well, and th- can I say one more thing about Karen Machine? Yeah. I've met him. I think I talked about this on the podcast before. 
He is one of the most charming men that I've ever met. Yeah, I about gave him my whole bank account just because he because he's amazing. Yeah, like he, I talked to him at um, at this one party that he was having at a studio. Talked to him for a little bit. He came back around, like he went around the party, came back, like remembered who I was, remember the conversation, basically picked up the conversation where we left off. Uh, And then like months later, I saw him again and we picked up the conversation where we left off again. That's crazy. Do you you remember your, did he remember your name? He, I, he remembered, yeah, he remembered my name. He remembered like, like my entire backstory. He's a robot. He's like, he is one of those people. And I think that a lot of star designers probably have this quality to them where they are they are charming. Like they're, they're, they're charming to clients, and then they're a they're a dictator in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's yeah, that's interesting. I I've heard Kareem Rashid talk before too, and yeah, he's an amazing speaker and just really I don't know plays to the the heartstrings of a designer. Yeah, I mean that's you know when you're pitching clients, I feel like a lot of times you're just like for somebody like Karim, he's selling himself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he does an amazing job selling himself. Yeah. Like I, after meeting him, I was like, oh, this is why you have so much work because like you're very likable. Right. Um, so anyway, you were, you were about to say something. I, yeah. I was, I was going to, I was going to propose a question. I, you know, star designers came about what in the past 20 years or so, I would say. I mean, we had Dita Rams, but what about, um, What's his name? We were talking about oh, him. Raymond Lowy? Yeah, Raymond Lowy. I guess he is a star. Okay. Sorry. Discount that fact. I don't <laughs> I don't know years. My question is, do you think star designers are dying? Like, do you think mm. that the designers of today will there be a star designer of today? I think we just have a different there's gonna be a different type of star designer. We call them the, the king designers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean I I look at you and I see you as a rising star designer. I don't, I'm not trying to like, you know, boost your ego or anything, but I've now worked with you. So I know that you have the chops to back it up. Okay. Um, But I, I think that like what a star designer needs to be today is exactly the path that you are pursuing. Interesting. Like I think what, the, what path the, is that? Though? I think the the path is somebody who is who is actually I mean, I think there's probably going to be many variants of this, but I think one variant is the accessible designer. You know, it's oh, like, like you can get a hold of me at any time. Well, it's like you th- you think of like Walt Disney back in the day. Walt Disney, like he was often in front of the camera, like kind of introducing his programming. That is and, interesting, though. Right? You know, there's there's this connection to the audience. There's mm-hmm. like, like, like here I am. I'm the magician, right? And now, like, I present to you like the magic. Cause, he, you know, cause, so because I think about Insta- Instagram stories, right? Mm-hmm. And how th- there are these stories that you know, whatever, five seconds of, you know, a, a video of you talking to the camera. But every time someone sees that five seconds of you, they're reminded of you. So if you do a story every single day that's just five seconds long, that means that every person is reminded of you every single day. Right. Which, I mean, you don't think about all your friends every single day. But if you watch their story, you think about them. Which is an interesting way that social media is inter- interplayed with this. I, I don't know if that was like really a point or anything but <laughs> just like an observation that i yeah. have that i've had but i i think that a you know i we saw with karim rashid like he has completely altered the way that he faces the public within the last couple of years he's a little instagram guy isn't he, he loves to do like and i watch them i watch all of his videos where he's walking around the street talking to the phone mm-hmm. talking about some philosophy stuff and yeah i love it yeah. i i think that it makes a lot of sense for him and his whole ethos about design and about technology and um i think that that is like that is one that is one mode of like how, um, 
you know, a star designer is going to operate right. going forward. But I also see there being room for like, you know, I essentially, a star designer is a form of artist. Like they are. Yeah. And, and like you have artists, you have like musical artists that are out there in the public, engaging the public all the time, like Kanye West, right. like right now. Yeah, yeah. And then you have people like the Frank Oceans of the world who drop some gold and then they disappear for years. You know, there's 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 many facets to the, to uh, to artists and to the star designer. Okay, one more question. Do you think I, I think this is kind of the root of the original topic was do you think star designers deserve the credit though if all they're doing is the napkin sketch and then having the interns actually design and cut it up? I think I think absolutely. I think absolutely they do because it is no small feat to create a unified vision like that is, you know, far reaching. Yeah. Um, the thing that I liken it to is my wedding actually and working with all the vendors at my wedding. Like my wife and I planned our wedding. We organized all the vendors. The day of, there were so many things that went, that like we saw that were like, that's not how we wanted it. Right. You know, where right. it's like, we actually, we had to be more on top of them than we realized. Yeah. And and it was this moment where I was like, oh my gosh, this is what people, this is what a star designer probably has to deal with all the time is making sure that like everybody that they've brought into their studio is, is uh, keeping the machine going right and I, in a way that they would approve of i would also echo your statement james i agree i think that star designers do deserve the credit even though the, you know the juniors and the seniors are doing the work i think they deserve the credit because i i i'm reminded of the old tale of paulo Picasso. Mm. remember paulo Picasso was like in the restaurant or something and the waiter asked for a sketch and he was like Okay, I can do you. I can do a sketch, and so he sketched out some, you know, wine bottle or something, and said, "All right, here's here's your piece of art. It's going to cost you ten thousand dollars." <laughs> and the waiter was like, "No, this is insane. It's not going to cost ten thousand dollars. You did it in thirty seconds. I watched you do it." And Pablo Picasso was like, "No, I didn't. I didn't do it in thirty seconds. It took me thirty five years to do this sketch." You know? Oh yeah. So you know, I I also have had a great friend tell me that design is all is just about making choices yeah um and anyone can be a designer because all you have to do is make a choice you Mm -hmm. go to ikea you make a choice right the difference though is that not everyone can be a great designer Mm because a lot of people make bad choices (laughs) (laughs) so so yeah star designers are just making choices you know they're they're saying here's my idea here's my napkin sketch to the junior level guys and the junior level guys are going to take that napkin sketch, make a ton of ideation off of it, and then the starter designer is going to come back and be like, "Okay, this is my choice. You know, this is this is what I've taken thirty five years to know that this one is the right one." Yeah. So I don't know. That that's my my final two cents. I think that's I think that's a good way to sum it up. But uh, but yeah. Uh, I hope you guys got got some interesting thoughts out of that one. And we got some questions this week. Oh, man. Questions. <laughs> okay, listen. So we actually had a lot of questions coming because we haven't had questions for like two weeks. Listen, but listen, everybody. James has a little uh, beef. I have a little announcement to make. <laughs> I, I, and I, I want to do this as gently as possible because I don't want people to feel discouraged from sending questions. Because we we are very appreciative of a your consistent support because like we have a lot of supporters out there and people who are sending us questions. The request that I have is that please make them as succinct as possible, as brief as you can, because we're working full time jobs, we're freelancing, we're doing a lot. It takes a lot for us to like set aside time to read an email yeah. and for it to be so, you know, for it to be any length longer than a paragraph (laughs) is a lot of time. Well, well, I I don't know how to read. (laughs) I don't know how to read either. So I just want to read in general. I don't know how you guys are sending us questions if you don't want to read. (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah, I, I think I 
having a succinct question at the beginning of an email would be helpful to us just to be able to pick through the emails. Yeah. I wish we could answer all of the questions on the podcast, but you know, there's only so much time for each podcast episode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, alternatively, it, it, yeah, yeah. If you guys could just, you know, kind of sum up your question in like one or two sentences and put that at the top of the email. And then if you want to write like lovey dovey stuff in the, the bottom or, or hate mail on the bottom, yeah, whichever way you like, alternatively uh, send us a send us a video or voice message oh you know there's podcasters doing the voicemail thing yeah we, we should set that up we should look into that because i would love because that's the other thing is like i i want to hear i want to hear voices i want to see faces it's gonna wanna, be so it'd be so great it would be great oh man um and and one voice and face that i would love to see is at mikey sketches yes mikey.sketches instagram also is the kiyoshi the kid from Mm. our uh intro and outro oh yeah mikey had an interesting question um he messaged me on my live stream and then just sent a full email and he has been interning for this design and technology studio and they specialize in like these you know kind of led installation things they're like 3d installations I, i i didn't look into it too much but mikey was tasked with designing these like extravagant things and you know there's not really a budget for it it's just like make these crazy led things and um you know it's not necessarily traditional industrial design where you're designing a product and mikey was like hey you guys are a design studio you're designing technology studio can we actually design products like are you guys interested in that and they kind of shrugged and like blew them off and oh no and and so he this is where mikey's question comes in Mikey, you know, is kind of deciding whether he should stick it out there and intern another three months, I believe, or something like that. And it it, it pays well. You know, they make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So this internship pays. He could stick it out there for another three months, or he could switch and possibly get a different job, but unpaid. Um, You know, a a different internship unpaid. Hmm. So, you know... He lives in San Francisco, and it's not cheap for sure. So I don't know. Do you have any advice? I mean, it depends on... I think that that takes uh, some pros and cons lists. I mean, I think internships... Like, if the internship, the unpaid internship, is something with a lot of promise, uh, that you get a lot of good experience, and there's no reason that an unpaid internship couldn't turn into a paid internship... What? You know. What are you talking about? I mean, I've never heard of that in my life. What are you talking about? You've t- you've heard of an unpaid internship turning into a paid internship? Why not? If your work was good enough, or like if you could if you could like prove that you could provide enough service. I guess yeah, maybe if you like proved it out and said, "Hey, I I want money," like halfway through the internship or something. Yeah, but um, I think if if the alternative, the unpaid, would mean good exposure to like you know, really good designers or, or whatever. I mean, I think it's atrocious that anybody would do an, like that, that any company would bring in unpaid interns. Yeah. I I think you should always get paid for your work. I agree. But on the other hand, like if it's something where like the only way you can get in the door is unpaid and it's only for a few months, like maybe it's worth it. That's a tough question. I I mean, the unpaid versus paid internship thing is is unfortunate that we have to have this conversation. I hopefully one day there won't even be a, a conversation about it. But yeah, I, I you know I think it depends on the internship again. Like if you can get if you can land one of those cool San Francisco studios, whether it's Fuse Project or whatever it is, and it's unpaid, like you know, I think it's worth it to go work at this internship you know maybe get a coffee shop job on the weekend or in the night you know figure out the money thing in your free time and then gain that exposure because you know having a stale kind of paying job is is fine like it pays the bills but since you're in college i i'll say this i'll say the one thing i regretted in college was being too frugal Mm. I, i think there were points in my college career where like I should just spend a little bit more money on, right. on like just a bit more experience. Yeah. In terms of like 
whether it was like building a, a model or something like that. But that's the that's the only thing I regret from my college experience. Yeah, I think um, I think for me, yeah. Similarly, I think broad more broadly, just being sort of risk adverse in college, mm. not taking enough risk. Yeah. Where like it would have been cool to take like. To, to find your dream studio and take an unpaid internship, like I don't think that looking back on it, if I had done something like that, I would have seen that as a waste of time. You know, like if I had done, if I had taken an internship in that way, I think it probably would be something that would shape me. Um, and yeah. where I am today. Here, here's what I'll here's what I'll do, I'll, Mikey. Here's what you should do. Are we gonna pay him? <laughs> no, no, we're no, gonna no. start paying you. The podcast makes zero dollars. Internship. The podcast makes negative. We're gonna dollars, give actually. you the minor details. Uh, <laughs> what's the word? Scholarship. <laughs> yes, it is a, a half bottle of wine. Yeah. Um, no, the he, I think you keep working at your place that you're working at now and apply to every single place you possibly can. I also would say, I, I don't know what your ties are to San Francisco. I would apply everywhere. Mm. I don't that, I don't necessarily say you have to stick to San Francisco and get the unpaid internship. Like, just apply to everywhere and mm. then see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes great things can happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's my advice. Okay, cool. We got another question. Maddie uh, asks, I'm an ID student in college and I'm having issues with making my dis- designs engineerable. Usually with a project, I get very excited and into making something look good or very interactive, but later into making the actual product, I realize it physically won't work. This is also affects sketching. I draw things that can't be made slash technically can't work. How do you guys keep engineering in mind when you start a project? I don't. <laughs> you know, one thing that happened to me when I when I came out of of uh, of school is that I didn't like I, I was kind of drawing things. I mean, I drew things in college that could be made, but like drawing in things like like wall thicknesses of product was never a part of my sketching repertoire. Until I left school, you drew you draw on wall thicknesses in your sketches. Yeah, what? What are you talking about? Oh yeah, no. Like if you're drawing something like a bowl and you're not drawing like the thickness oh, of that bowl. Yeah, yeah. Of course. You know? Yeah, yeah. Or like even just like the fillet or like whatever it is. I see. I see. You know. Okay. There's. I think that in school, school is about like the unengineerable. I like definitely the, agree. Yes. <laughs> Don't think about engineering in design school. Don't, no. Don't worry about that. Think about design. Yeah. I think, um, you know, we were just talking about star designers and like you look at some of their sketches and it might just be a gesture. Like it's something like their sketches are not necessarily to illustrate the final thing. It's right. to inform the process to get to the final thing. Yes. So I don't think that you need to think about engineerable like... You know, it it is something to like to understand like okay, what is the thickness of this handle? Like how do I represent that? And and I think that you can make it this cyclical process of like I'm going to sketch something, I'm going to model something and then like sketch sketch things that look like the model that you just made or like reflect the model that you just made to start to understand like the connection between those two forms right yeah definitely maddie you don't have to make your sketches be actual production products like you can just make you can just make like a piece of plastic you know spray painted gold or whatever and call it a wearable device like right it doesn't have to contain any electronics or be engineerable it's just it's the design intent that is what you're trying to learn in school yeah but i think that like yeah, basically through experience, through, you know, the experience of a project, through the experience that you'll get professionally, uh, like you'll start to s- consider those things. There's and, a time and place for it for sure. And too. like, I think that there is something to understanding the rules so that you can break them. Mm-hmm. Um, 
instead of just like not understanding the rules at all. But that is a gradual process. Yeah, and, and I also think that that is a latter part of the process. Right. You definitely don't want to think about engineering at the very beginning. No. Because that'll stifle all creativity. Right. If you think about how something's made and how big the electronics are that had to fit into it, like you're going to be thinking way too much about the the actual dimensions and everything that you're not even going to be, be able to come up with an interesting design. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, you know, you run into people who are too, are like heavily engineering focused and like they they can't break out of the box. Yeah. Like when they start the project, they're already thinking of the constraints. Right. And, you know, like design is a process of, of like unveiling the constraints in a way of like, you know, going through and, but taking that vision through. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. uh that was a good question. That is a good question. Take your time, Maddie. Yeah. You got time. Um, we have a, another question. Our last question comes from Oren, and they say, I see that you guys both sketch with a level of looseness and imperfection, although have developed a way of communicating your ideas efficiently through your style. Effectively. Effectively through your style. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Uh, but I also guess that y- these things aren't things you present to your clients. And I guess Oren's question is, do you see the value in a more refined sketch and why? I, I yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you, what value do you see in a more refined sketch, Nick? It so, I maybe I, I don't know if the question's phrased right. I'm trying to think of a way to rephrase it. I well, first of all, I don't necessarily see your your sketches as like loose and imperfect my sketches are definitely tighter than yours yeah but i think there's i think there's still a quickness to them yes um especially they're faster than a lot of other sketches i see on the internet yeah um i think the 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 problem this is the kind of the problem with instagram the rub is that the sketches that we put on instagram may or may not be actual sketches that we would actually present to a client right like i would never present the fidelity of a chair sketch to a client because there's no reason to take two hours and sketch out some extravagant chair Mm -hmm. when i could model it in 30 minutes and render it out to be even more realistic right um it, it you know there there's the idea which maybe is like more of what you show a lot of james i think your sketches are very representative of what you present to clients. But I also, the funny thing, I, and I've told this, I think, before, but I remember when we first met, you know, I would always see your sketches online and be like, oh, you got that, you know, you had the contour sketching style, you have that, like, continuous line, whatever it is. And then I came to your house and you're like, yeah, here's some of my other sketches. And you open up this book and they're like, beautiful renders and i'm like what <laughs> what marker renders like i didn't even know you could do this james i thought you could just like doodle with a pencil and like no i mean it depends like it, it's all it's all client dependent and um i mean i have this dichotomy where i really love loose sketching for my, myself but i love really tight cartoony sketching for clients mm. because my feeling is is that I need to communicate, but I mean, there is sort of a, a middle ground that's, that's, that's sort of emerging between the two as I continue to experiment. Cause I see my sketching communication style, like I'm continually experimenting with it. Yeah. Um, but after seeing the creative sessions workshop at square one, where they showed the level of their presentation sketching and how it wasn't that dissimilar from the looseness of my sketching with just like with I mean with some of my sketching the same level of rendering I mean I think that there there's room for that kind of sketching as long as it communicates the idea that you want to convey yeah and and also that the fidelity doesn't distract from the communication, I think. Because I think that there's a level of fidelity that can communicate that you have more figured out than you actually yeah. do. Like if you have every single line crisp and clean and detailed in there, then people are going to be like, oh, well, that's 
that chair sketch is is not correctly dimensioned. Right. It needs to be two inches shorter. But right. it's really just a sketch. Yeah. So, like, I think that there's a balance. Right. There's definitely a balance there. Because in different stages of the process, you want to communicate different things. Yeah. And early on, you certainly don't want to communicate that you have it all figured out. Because you don't. Like... You don't, you don't want to present anything that gives that impression because yeah. you need room. Every design process is essentially the beginning of a scientific hypothesis. And you are going through... <laughs> oh, man, we just went into science. Here. Yeah. You are going through the motions of like proving and disproving your hypothesis. And you don't want to... Like you don't want to start out by saying, I get it. I understand it. That is true. That's an interesting analogy. It's like saying like, it's like starting off a scientific, a, a scientific problem with the solution. Yeah, that's hmm. you. You never do that. That's a bad scientist. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I I hope that was helpful to you, Orin. Um, and of course, if you guys had questions, feel free to email minordetailspodcast at gmail dot com. Keep them short and sweet up in the top and. And then uh, if you want to write a lengthy uh, lengthy paragraph, we'll, we'll certainly read it. But just when we when we do the podcast, we sort through all the emails and we try to kind of pick out the question at the top. So it's just easier for us to sort them. Right. Um, so send send them those send your emails our way and we'll we'll be happy to look at them. Um, of course, every week we like to shout out a person that is doing interesting things. Mm-hmm. on instagram and oh, this yeah. week we wanted to shout out nick bentil and that is at n-i-k no c i'm a c guy this is a nick without a c n-i-k it's so edgy b-e-n-t-e-l and mm-hmm. he might be considered more of an artist slash designer mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to a traditional industrial designer but uh he is he he's has this ongoing project of making his body furniture. Mm. Um, there's this video online of him. Well, there's there's lots of photos of him actually being pieces of furniture. Like he's naked, st- like laying like on the ground, being a coffee table, mm. <laughs> or he's like sitting up on the uh, upon a wall and being a chair. It, it's kind of conceptual. Um, I mean, historically, that's that was the case of like slaves in in like past societies. Really, they, like they in, had to bend over and like be tables. Oh yeah, well they had to like be chairs. There were like that's crazy. Yeah, I I I could be wrong, but I feel like I remember this from art history. I'm sure it's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I I also will highlight another thing that Nick Bentil's done is that he built a stool with only his body. Like a wooden stool with only his body. So he has this whole video, and you can search it online. But he went out into the woods and found a dead tree, pushed it over with his hands, drug it back to the wood shop, and then took his teeth, started stripping away wood with his teeth and like carving, carving legs of the stool, hammering things together with his hands. There was no tools involved, just his body. Wow. Which, yeah, it's kind of crazy because, yeah. That's incredible. But, yeah, he's a he's, he has some really interesting conceptual work, and definitely check him out. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess that, that about wraps it up. Yeah. Of course, our intro and outro are by Kiyoshi the Kid. Blah! Thank you for the question, by the way, Mikey Sketches. Yeah. Um, subscribe on iTunes, Apple Play. Get on that YouTube uh rate like all that jazz <laughs> and it's written out so he has to say all that jazz <laughs> um but yeah thanks for tuning in you guys as always i'm at nick p baker and i'm at i draw receipts peace out later